Hello, everybody. I think we're ready to get underway. I'm sure more people will be joining as we go. But uh, thanks for joining us tonight for this webinar on Parkinson's disease research. My name is Rory Catherine Jones. Um, I, for many years, was uh, a BBC journalist uh, and uh, had my Parkinson's diagnosis uh, at the beginning of 2019, so uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, and I'm I'm on medication, and I'm uh, doing fine, uh, and I'm taking a great interest, in particular, in the, the uh, in what we're talking about tonight, where the research is going. And tonight we're, we're going to be speaking with uh, Professor of Clinical Neuroscience and Consultant Neurologist uh, Michelle Hu. And Michelle leads the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Service uh, at Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust one of only seven nationally accredited atypical Parkinson's clinics, uh, and she's co-principal investigator of the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Center too. A big thank you for all the uh, excellent questions you've already sent in. We've had more than 20, so we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. If you want to ask a question during the event, uh, please don't shout out, uh, just post it in the Q&A box. It's the little speech bubble at the bottom right of your screen and we'll do our best to answer it. Please ensure your camera and microphone are turned off. Uh, it's the buttons at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if you want to change how the speakers appear, move us around in our little boxes, click the three buttons at the bottom of the screen uh, next to the red phone icon, then change layout, then select the sidebar or spotlight setting. That's sidebar or spotlight. Now, we're not going to be able to, unfortunately, answer any questions about individual cases. Please talk to a healthcare professional if you've got any questions about your care or concerns. Uh, we're talking about the, 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 the general progress in, in research tonight. Uh, tonight is being recorded and you'll be sent a copy of the recording. Uh, this event has been organised by the National Institute for Health and Care Research, the, NH, the, NI, or the NIHR, which is a government funded body that funds research in the NHS, public health and social care. It's been organized as well tonight with the support of Cure Parkinson's, a charity dedicated to finding new treatments to slow, stop or reverse the progression of Parkinson's. If you're interested in learning more about research uh, and to search for studies you can take part in, then please visit the Be Part of Research website. Just search for Be Part of Research. Remember, you can take part in many uh, studies even if you don't have a health condition yourself. Uh, I'm on, I think, a couple of Parkinson's trials right now, including one about sweet sleep. Um, but let's get going. Michelle, are you ready for um, all these uh, dozens of questions we've got lined up for you? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, Rory, and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for giving your time as well. So, yeah, far away. No worries. Just before we plunge in uh, to, and as I said, we've got some great questions. I, I, I just want to ask a personal one. What What is the most exciting area of research that you're in right now? What What makes you get up in the morning and think, that's that's great, that's really interesting? I think it's, a, it's developing um, AI methods. So a ways in which we approach data to really try and understand what makes different people present in different ways. And if we take that knowledge and put that into a formula, then we have the potential to really compare apples with apples, pairs with pairs. And that's the, that's the case for Parkinson's, but it's also the case for a very early phase called prodromal Parkinson's, where people have a sleep disorder. And in this sleep disorder, they enact their dream. Uh, and you dream in REM phase. So this is called rapid eye movement or REM phase sleep behavior disorder. This offers us the opportunity to intervene really early in Parkinson's to potentially cure this condition, i.e. prevent people getting it all together. Well, that is interesting. And that, that relates to the, um, the first couple of questions. We've had two questions about this. With all this research going on, how close to a cure are you? As there seems to be much, so much said about research in this area, giving people with Parkinson's false hope. Um, I know we all, we all get used to seeing kind of big headlines in, in papers that sort of glide in and say, huge breakthrough, and then we don't hear anything more about it. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really important that you give people realistic expectations of what their participation and trial is actually going to deliver. 
both for the science of Parkinson's, for other people and themselves. I think we know a lot more about how to live well with Parkinson's and we do have uh, two sort of interventions that I think slow it down and the evidence is going to emerge more on that, i.e. modify the progression. But actually curing Parkinson's in an individual, in a person who's had it well established, I think is going to be difficult. But I think helping them to live well with it, live life to the full and also to slow it down so they get that extra time of good quality life is really key and I think that's going to be that is tangible that's tangible now um the other what, thing is there are drugs that, out there in, in uh, trial or what so I'm talking really about exercise I'm talking right. about the role of exercise which has been shown to slow down the progression of motor Parkinson's so symptoms like tremor stiffness slowness of movement um and it's been shown in now four very comprehensive what we call a sort of a placebo controlled trials. The exercise itself, however, is quite challenging. We're talking about high impact or high intensity exercise and it, uh, all the research- I that my two, two miles a day walking is not, not enough. It's gonna be enough. So, yeah, that might be enough. So what might be useful would be to have a heart rate monitor to see what's happening to your heart rate. Because this type of exercise has to be able to get your heart rate up <laughs> and also maintain an increased heart rate for quite a period of time so to give an example uh, people that have the, the sort of protocols have been things like exercising against resistance on a stationary bike where the resistance is increasing and then decreasing increasing again a bit like interval training at the gym and i think those that's been the most studied intervention and that needs to be done for 45 minutes three times a week right over a year to show that um your parkinson's progresses or slows down uh, and that magnitude or amount of benefit is equivalent to um basically adding in levodopa medication for someone or uh, for our top neuroprotective drug candidates like exenatide which we're currently trialing in the uk i think lots of people will ask about that exercise program um, yeah why why is my consultant not put me on it <laughs> so we don't have it available on the nhs however there are a number of uh web-based programs so one of the big challenges for exercise is the modification in behavior right and it's not in itself without risk so all of the studies reported they did have some people who fell off the bike or injured their knee getting on or off uh, they had a few, I'm talking about small numbers here, so yeah. out of two to 400 people in the active exercise intervention trial, maybe numbers of three to five where they had a fainting spell or had a musculoskeletal injury associated. Um, but uh, that aside, it is a deliverable program. But keeping up the motivation so that you do it three times a week every week for 52 weeks of the year is the challenge and the recent study conducted from holland with baz bloom used some really cool innovation to actually improve what we call compliance which is sticking with the regime so they encouraged the participants remotely during the sessions with an app and that's gamification so they they got their statistics they were told they were doing really well they could see how they were doing and they also incorporated video game element to the cycling so you were like in a race against no. other people with competitors so these sorts of tricks and also having a remote physiotherapist who could actually monitor your heart rate while you were exercising to see that you're actually doing the intensity also helped i'm going to merge two questions now uh, are there any advances with drug treatment to delay the onset of parkinson's and somebody else has asked, does Cinemet slow progression of the disease at all? Oh, okay, that's those are two great questions. So I'm going to ask, answer the last question first. Mm. Cinemet itself does not delay the progression of Parkinson's. Um, and that's been shown sort of quite conclusively. Yeah. Um, if we dial the, the clock back 20 years, at one stage when dopamine agonists were like the next best thing to slice bread, 
There was even a theory going around that levodopa or cinemet or manipar, which are the sort of two commonly used preparations in the UK for levodopa and a carbidopa inhibitor, that that, that levodopa was toxic, right? And uh, there were pharmaceutical companies and others sort of going around saying it was toxic. That has been totally disproved. The concentrations they were using are roughly 10 to 100 times greater than what a person with Parkinson's would be exposed to. However, we do know that it helps the symptoms by around 30 to 50 percent, uh, but it doesn't slow down progression. The same goes for all Parkinson's medication therapies in common use currently, and things like deep brain stimulation, apomorphine, and duodopa therapy, which are these more complex treatments given for some people with Parkinson's with complex uh, phase. So the other question is, what research have we got into other drugs uh, that might slow down progression of Parkinson's? So I can give you some sort of top five candidates that I think will be really interesting that are currently uh, being tested. So I've mentioned something called exenatide or exendin. This is a treatment for that's licensed in the UK for type two diabetes. And it's often used for people who have had type 2 diabetes, which is the adult onset version, often associated with being a bit more overweight. And it's linked to other increased risks like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, stroke, heart attack. And this is an injection given once a week. And Tom Faltini, who you may know, is a neurologist at Queen Square or the National Hospital UCL London. He is leading this phase three trial in the UK. So we, are, we have just recruited to target all 200 people to this study, which is gonna look at 100 given the active exenatide, 100 the dummy, and it's gonna follow them up over two years. But all the data so far suggests that it does slow down progression of Parkinson's exenatide. The question is, how long will it work? Will it work beyond just 12 months? So this 24 month study will answer it. And Cure Parkinson's are also funding us as a sub-study of this to use a wearable, a digital smartphone test that's on a normal uh, phone that you might use. And it tests components of your Parkinson's symptoms at home. So it provides a parallel measure of how you're doing. So right. it's energy at the top. Yeah. Uh, from the chat is a question, is it okay to be on a waiting list for more than one research trial? So I think that's absolutely fine. I mean, you know, you are the consumer in a way as the person with Parkinson's and increasingly people are realizing that it is possible to be involved in more than one trial at a time. It depends on the individual trial requirements, what we call the inclusion or exclusion criteria. So the, the discovery cohort I run, we have people there uh, who are, this is a natural history study, it's following people up to see how they progress every 18 months. But we now record if they've taken part in a different trial. And I think the same goes for being on waiting lists for more than one trial. Have a look, see what's out there. Um, and um, you know, there's no harm in getting as much information as possible. And you can always drop out later if it's not for you. Uh a question about is there research into drooling we're told drooling is because people with parkinson's just don't swallow yeah. them i think there's more to it says this person because i drool when i eat or drink anything sweet and then sometimes my mouth goes completely dry mm. so drooling is a major problem for many of my people with parkinson's i look after we are traditionally teaching that a bit like your blinking which you don't do as much in somebody who has parkinson's the swallowing is also reduced the spontaneous swallow, but I think Parkinson's also causes a lot of what we call autonomic symptoms. It can cause increased skin sweating, uh, it can cause profuse sweating after eating, uh, it can cause dribbling, and it can also affect blood pressure regulation, uh, bladder, uh, bowel function, and also erectile function. So these are all really common symptoms in Parkinson's, and I think the dribbling is probably going to be related to that in addition to just not swallowing enough. As you can imagine, this is not the most sexy research project that you're gonna basically apply for funding for. However, I am part of the Parkinson's UK Excellence Network, 
And what that does is bring together health professionals looking after people with Parkinson's. And the speech and language therapy department at the Royal Berkshire Hospital did a trial where they actually compared having a regular beeper timer that is on an app on your phone that went off every 30 minutes. And that was the trigger of the person to swallow, whether or not it's with a glass of water or sucking on a sugar free sweet. And then they compared the benefit of that intervention with the best medications we have and found that they were on the same uh, level of magnitude. So same level of benefit from simply swallowing on a regular basis and being reminded to do so. Now this app is available for free download on the Parkinson's UK app. And I would also say is I tell all my patients to try it first because many of the medications used are loaded with side effects, drowsiness, dry mouth, uh, and also confusion, particularly in people who are over the age of 70 or 80 years. Right. Um, now, this is another question which I think a lot of people are, are asking, uh, certainly been to, to me. What's the research into Parkinson's being hereditary? Yeah. yeah. So we've always known that if you have a family history, meaning start a blood relative, who is either first degree, so that would be a sibling, uh, a mother or a father, or a second degree, so that could be like a grandparent, aunt, uncle, etc., or niece. If you've got somebody like that in the family with Parkinson's, it increases your individual risk. However, that's not the full story. Um, research into Parkinson's started by looking at twin studies. So you can have what's called a monozygotic twin, or um, a where the egg literally splits in half and you've got the same genetic, or you can have a dizygotic twin where you have simultaneous fertilization uh, of two separate eggs. So the monozygotic are theoretically genetically identical and they have uh, looked at people who were separated at birth, so they have different environmental risks. So those early studies showed that the genetics doesn't explain everything about why some people get Parkinson's and others don't. And that is to do with the environmental risk. So if I'm counseling someone in clinic, uh, what I say to them is if you have a first degree relative with Parkinson's, your lifelong risk of getting Parkinson's yourself increases from two to 3% of somebody of your age and gender, the general population without the family history to roughly 9% if you live to be 85 or 90. So that means you've got a 90% chance, even with a first degree relative like a dad, uh, of, of living to be 85 and not developing Parkinson's. Right. That's the case for most people with Parkinson's we see in the general population who are unselected. We now can test for some genes that we know slightly increase your risk, but they don't increase your risk by that much and the genes we can test for are present in less than 10% of all people out there in the community living with their Parkinson's. So does that give you a bit of a rough ballpark figure? That, that's very useful. Um, I, 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 one of the trials I was in was about whether it's genetic or whatever. Yeah. Uh, my father had Parkinson's. Oh. Um, now, we've had two questions about this. I've never heard of this. What research is taking place into photobiomodulation? Do you know what that yeah. is? Yeah. Well, I had to look it up. <laughs> so I haven't heard of this. I looked up the study. So I can tell you photobiomodulation or PBM therapy is the use of narrow bands or wavelengths of light, but they don't produce heat. So an example would be laser or LED lights. And there is an evidence base in animal models with Parkinson's and in cell models that using uh, this PBM therapy either prolongs the survival of the dopamine brain neurons, which are very important because in your brain they're producing dopamine, which you haven't got enough of in Parkinson's, or that it helped the symptoms in the animals that had Parkinsonism. So I'm aware of only one study that was published very very recently last year and it was what was called a proof of concept so it was basically is it feasible is it tractable it was tested in 12 people with parkinson's 
and they had to uh, administer this uh, PBM uh, at their brain le level, neck and abdominal level. And it seemed that uh, their fine motor skills, their balance, memory and general walking ability were significantly improved after 12 weeks of this um, PBM treatment and up to one year. However, as the authors quite rightly say, this is just really setting the groundwork for a much larger study that needs to see if it can replicate this data. But is it's, that the placebo effect? Because it's, it's yeah. very difficult to, to do, have the sort of placebo trial where yeah. you, 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 you yes. don't give people the treatment. That's completely right. I mean, and this, this study was uh, conducted in Adelaide in Australia. Um, and I think that they did actually have a placebo um, non-thermal light therapy so that oh, right. the person didn't know. Right. And, and they're trying really hard with, with this to do it. But yeah, I agree. Placebo effects are massive uh, in Parkinson's particularly because you're hoping so much it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, from the chat, how do you, and I think this is somebody picking up on what you said about exercise. How do you determine what exercise is high intensity? For example, the heart rate for a 60 year old should be a maximum of 160 beats per minute. Should I aim for over 45 minutes? No. So there's no evidence that doing more than 45 minutes and exercising above is actually going to be a benefit to you. And in fact, it probably could be detrimental in that it's pushing you too hard. So yeah. the thing the thing to say firstly is, you know, these studies were all uh, conceptualized and delivered by medical health professionals. So, you know, neurologists, but then there were physiotherapists and there were exercise, exercise experts in the study. So they were supervising and overseeing the regime. And it's unrealistic to expect to just be able to suddenly be able to do this 45 minutes three times a week so my advice to patients is see if you can join a local gym um, everyone active gyms are offering free membership across the UK for anyone with Parkinson's and as part of that package they and other gyms usually offer a free session with a personal trainer one-on-one -on -one so that you learn the equipment and you learn yourself what is reasonable and then the aim would be that you set up, you set yourself up with a regular program that you do regularly. I see all the time that the people in my clinic, and I look after probably 500 people with Parkinson's, the ones that exercise do better, right? Um, they do much better. So um, I think it needs to be, yeah, it needs to be supervised. It needs to be a long haul, but... Uh, Pilates. Is Pilates good? I do Pilates once a week. Yeah, so Pilates has actually been shown in a, in a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine to be beneficial in people with Parkinson's compared to placebo Pilates or best practice exercise in right. improving core strength, improving posture, improving balance and reducing falls risk. So right. Pilates is good for those targeted things, um, but in terms of slowing down your progression, of Parkinson's, it seems to be the high impact exercise. Right. One other thing I haven't mentioned is in Oxford, uh, we have a very bright professor of biochemistry who has developed a ketone drink. Uh, and this is a supplement that people can take. It's FDA approved um, and it's licensed for a dietary supplement. So it's used by elite athletes to improve their athletic performance. It's very expensive. But in Oxford, we're working with Professor Kieran Clark and we're recruiting people to a ketone trial. And what we're doing, we're actively recruiting now. We're looking for people with Parkinson's who can continue taking their usual medication. It doesn't involve a scan, doesn't involve a lumbar puncture or anything like that. It's a four week uh, study where you take the dummy uh, placebo drink or the active. You take it three times a week, three times a day, sorry over four weeks and we monitor your Parkinson's symptoms using questionnaire in clinic and digital and what we hope is that this will show a signal of improvement and we can then apply to a larger study but our previous ketone study we actually gave it to 16 people with Parkinson's right and I selected them because they liked doing exercise biking and what we did was work with Professor Helen Dawes at Brooks University 
and we tested their people's exercise performance, literally, how long can you pedal against a fixed resistance and you were timed on the bike. And compared to your normal baseline, if you were given the ketone supplement, the average improvement in resistance pedaling was 30%, and we had some individuals who improved up to 80%. So what I'd like to do is a trial where we look at exercise intervention plus or minus the Delta Ketone supplement. Right, sounds interesting. Uh, another question, are there any recommendations for impact on mental health in Parkinson's? My experience has been focused on managing physical symptoms with medication. I have pursued cognitive behavioral therapy and antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication. Yeah, I think that raises a really important question, um, which somebody else has also raised in the chat about what is the role of things like anxiety on Parkinson's motor symptoms and, you know, what research is being done on that. So I see time again when people come to clinic that if they've got a major anxiety issue this impacts significantly on their motor symptoms so everybody even without a diagnosis of panic attacks or generalized anxiety disorder with parkinson's will say that when they're under pressure they're in a queue and somebody behind them is waiting for them to get the money out or their car their tremor just goes up through the roof if they're on a tube and they get off or they're in a really busy place and somebody walks towards them they freeze I can think of a younger onset patient who used to freeze going from his the clinic waiting room uh, to my room and was not on any um, levodopa medication. So he delayed for five years. And I saw him one time and he walked in with no freezing. And I said, you want, you started treatment. He said, no, I've just got resolution, you know, with my marriage, where I'm living with, you know, who, how often I can see my children. And just that alone, with no medication change, had this massive impact. So uh, we also see that high levels of depression anxiety tend to be linked to faster progression because they, and we don't know why that is. Um, also, we've shown a PD subtype with high levels of uh, impaired sleep, uh, sleep fragmentation, REM sleep behavior disorder, have higher levels of anxiety and depression and present much further along. So I want to do some research on this. The question is, how do you measure? What's the biological measurement that most reflects anxiety levels that can be sort of done literally on a millisecond by millisecond basis? Um, it might be heart rate. Um, it could be other physiological changes like how much you sweat, uh, pupil dilation. And I'm just working on the right tool to measure it to see how it impacts. Uh, we've got a, somebody is interested in signing up to your ketone trial, asking how they do it. Yeah, fantastic. So um, I had set up a Twitter account, but it wasn't quite right. So as of tomorrow, I will have a new Twitter account and we can tell you all about that. But we have an email um, and that's parkinsons.research at nhs.net. Um, Oliver, I don't know if it's possible to make that available, but if you email that, that will, that's the research study team at Oxford and they will send your details on and send you the information sheet for the ketone study and anything else that uh, you might be suitable for. So this we'll is- We'll put that in the chat. We'll put that in the chat. It's but in the chat yeah. now, parkinsons.research at nhs.net. And this right. sort of then talk actually leads me on to just sort of say about, you know, why can't we get more people involved in research trials? Mm. You know, what's the limitation? And often it's to do with the ethical and clinical governance um, limitations. And so to try and sort of avoid that, we set up um, an NHS database and anyone who comes to get clinic, just get us asked, are you interested in hearing about research opportunities? Uh, can your details, your email, your address be passed on to the research team directly and they'll contact you. And we've set that up, it's been highly successful. We've got over 1,200 people signed up with Parkinson's in Oxfordshire. And it means we can use that immediately to select people who would be suitable for trials as and when they come available. Uh, another question, is research anywhere near to helping personalise treatments and medication? Uh, yes, so I think that a lot of the work that I have done with my team at the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre um, that we published on uh, is about personalised therapies. So the current 
uh, the Discovery Cohort, the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre Cohort. It's got funding for another five years from Parkinson's UK. And we will then have followed up over uh, a thousand people from baseline through to about 600 people currently uh, over 10 to 15 years of living with Parkinson's. So the aim of that is to give somebody at diagnosis what we call a sort of personalised index. And that means just putting in some very simple metrics that we can do in clinic, um, your age, your movement, etc. And then we can tell you roughly what to expect if you want to know uh, at you know, 3, 5, 10, 15 and 20 years in to living with your Parkinson's. Personalised medicine involves getting more readouts on you, how your mood, your sleep, your general Parkinson's motor symptoms change. And to do that, we need digital tools. And we also need to be able to subtype different forms of Parkinson's, which is a lot of the research we've been doing. That is now going to start informing clinical trials because people are recognising that unless you subtype people or what we call stratify them, sort them into you know apples pears uh, and oranges at the beginning and you know you can't you won't get meaningful outcome data because your differences or the benefit of a drug will be masked by the this very sort of um variable group of individuals that you're comparing does that make sense that makes sense yeah now we've got the next few questions are on a similar theme various kinds of uh treatments that may may or may not uh, work is there any convincing research about the efficacy of vitamin b1 in parkinson's somebody sent me a whole book about this which mm. i haven't quite read yet no so i mean you that person might be a bit more up to date but my understanding is that vitamin b1 you know it's very rare to actually be deficient in vitamin b1 uh, it's thiamine, so we tend to see people who are deficient if they've had severe alcohol excess problems, they're alcoholic, if they've been nutritionally not looking after themselves, or they've had major gastric surgery or they're malabsorbing nutrients from the gut. So the efficacy for me would be, are they showing efficacy in people with normal vitamin B1 levels? If so, I'd be surprised because the body's very good at excreting excessive uh, vitamin B1 out in the urine. Um, and I'd be slightly worried that you'd be spending a lot of money in it going down the pan, literally. Right. OK. Uh, what part does nutrition play in Parkinson's? For example, claims for colostrum, pumpkin seeds and peanuts, yeah. their, their effectiveness. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we can... <laughs> It's very difficult. I did tend to be quite sceptical about alternative medicine and diet until I saw a very interesting talk with delivery uh, of a type of vestibular stimulation in the ear and how that helps somebody's migraine significantly. I think the diet aspect is really, there's no magic cure for that. One of the main problems is many people with Parkinson's have issues with their gut motility. That affects them and it makes them more likely to get constipation and delayed gastric emptying. So the main thing with the diet is lots of fluid, keep yourself regular. If you're not regular, take something. And Laxido is my first line recommendation because it's got the best evidence base. Laxido is also known as Movicol. And take something regularly to keep yourself regular because if you're bunged up, you won't be absorbing your medication and it's gonna have big other impacts. There is some very interesting uh, emerging data on what's called the microbiome microbiome of the gut is the normal collection of microorganisms that live in your gut from your mouth all the way down to the anus and there have been some interesting studies showing that this is altered in people with parkinson's and it's also altered in people who have an inflammatory bowel disease and therefore things like uh, simprove which is a, a sort of a supplement to try and improve the microbiome are currently being trialed and I'm more and more convinced that there is a link from the gut to the brain. It may be in future, once we've got a better understanding of this, that we can correct bacterial differences uh, through therapy. And we can also use that route as a way to deliver treatment. So for anyone who's taking part in Oxford Discovery, we are now about to start poo collections. Right. If you need to know a bit more about the mechanics of that, I'll have an online offline discussion, but it can all be done at home. Uh, it's delivered on dry ice by courier, and then we analyse it in the lab. 
Uh, do you have an opinion on the effectiveness? Uh, I, I, not, not sure how to pronounce this. Glutathione and or NAD supplementation. Yeah, I mean, again, unless I could be mistaken, um, because there are trials being published all the time. But as far as I'm aware, none of these have really been trialed rigorously in terms of a placebo controlled trial in large number of patients to show benefit. Um, and on a slightly different theme, what's the prognosis for someone diagnosed with a condition in their 30s? What's the best way to support parents with a young family? Yeah, absolutely key. So I've got really interested in sort of working age group or work WAG, uh, people who have Parkinson's who are younger. They firstly, young onset Parkinson's is sort of probably you know, the definition for that varies. But strictly speaking, it's probably people who've developed Parkinson's before the age of 40. And that is affects five to ten percent of everyone with Parkinson's. And they have a totally different uh, outlook and needs actually at the time of diagnosis. So they're often working, they're often providing for a family, they've got a lot of dependents, um, they've got issues uh, with the future that are really often quite imminent. And so, um, however, the good news is that if you develop Parkinson's of younger onset, you tend to do better. You do better than somebody who develops it at older age. And there are lots of reasons or potential hypotheses why, which I won't go into. But in general, people progress much more slowly. Uh, they um, also respond very well to medication. But the trick is getting them the right amount of medication and not overdosing and not getting it too high because younger people can get more regularly. Um, also for women, there are a lot of issues to do with hormones, the menstrual cycle, pregnancy, and the menopause, which all affect Parkinson's symptoms significantly. And I, don't, I think we need more research into that because it's a really key area. So in terms of support, in Oxfordshire, we have the Working Age Group, or WAG, for younger onset people with Parkinson's. It's led uh, by a couple, uh, who um, one of whom has developed Parkinson's, was diagnosed at the age of mid-20s. And that is provides peer support. They will have in lawyers, employment lawyers, to give advice on, you know, what's your rights with work? What benefits? How can you support your family? How do you tell your children? that you've got Parkinson's, yeah. you know, all of those sorts of things. But it is something that I would think would really deserve more resource. Uh, and I know that people in the Parkinson's Excellence Network were looking at it. We actually formed a network of neurologists who were really keen to sort of put other people in contact nationally to sort of give them a voice. Uh, another question about trials here. Can people take part in research if they have mid to late stage Parkinson's and comorbidities? Yes, absolutely. So let me just go through, we've currently got 14 trials in Oxfordshire where I work. And of those, there are some that are for people uh, with moderate to later stage Parkinson's. So I'll go through them. Um, one is looking at the effect of people who have Parkinson's and depression, and it's called ADEPT PD. And this is comparing the effect of two antidepressants, escitalopram and naltriptyline. Um, there's also a study looking at deep brain stimulation, which is usually performed for people with sort of moderate to more advanced Parkinson's, and that's called Cartesia. Uh, we're also doing a study called CHIEF PD. And these are for people with more advanced Parkinson's who are falling regularly. And we're looking at whether the medication, a cholinase raising inhibitor, prevents falls in this group. Exenatide PD, I've mentioned, is now close to recruitment, but it was looking at people with moderate Parkinson's, uh, you know, who were on treatment and having what we call fluctuations going from on to off. The ketone study, that's open to anyone uh, within five years of their, I think, or possibly, no, it's actually open to anyone, irrespective of how long they've had Parkinson's, provided their balance is okay. The reason being, we're putting you on a bike uh, or we're, you know, monitoring your activity. Um, what else? Um, pop hat. This is a trial for people with moderate to advanced Parkinson's who have visual hallucinations, and it's testing a medication called on Dancitron. This is used 
therapy, but it's actually here being tested to see if it helps visual hallucinations. Um, and then we also have, lastly, PD Frontline or Rhapsody, uh, which is a study uh, looking at a genetic mutation called GBA. But anyone with Parkinson's can sign up to Rhapsody, which means that they would provide some information at home and a saliva or cheek swab sample, and that would then be tested for GBA mutations. So that's the first study. And then if you've got one of these, that information will be conveyed back to you with pretest counselling. And then you'll have the opportunity to sign up to something called the Ambroxol trial. Ambroxol is a, a medication that's in, that was actually in early cough mixture. Um, and it's very well tolerated. It's taken uh, orally as a tablet or liquid. There's no major side effects. And they found that people with Parkinson's who took Ambroxol for a cough, uh, you know, got better. Their Parkinson's improved. The, the main lead for this is Professor Tony Shapira, who's uh, at UCL in London. And they've done a number of trials now, which seem to show, if you look at cells from people with Parkinson's and models, what Ambroxol does is help the cell recycle its own rubbish. And all of us have rubbish and debris um, DNA, misfolded proteins, they all have to be cleared from the cell. And this system that does it is called the lysosomal system. And what Ambroxol seems to be doing is improving this cell recycling, rubbish recycling. Uh, and the phase three trial for this, which is going to be large numbers in the hundreds of people with Parkinson's, is going to be launching next year. But uh, PD Frontline is the one where you can just sign up online register yourself, do the in basic information and a saliva swab at home. So you can have, do that without coming into a hospital or seeing a doctor uh, and you then have the genetic test done to put you into uh, Ambroxol. Because what that study is doing is targeting people with a particular mutation called GBA, where cell recycling is particularly effective. The, the trial I'm on is something to do with those, uh, are they called glycophates, those yeah, glycogen, uh, finger lipids, um, and yeah, other things, yeah, long yeah. names. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, quite a long question here. Can you please outline how NHS consultants match their patients with possible new treatments? I was diagnosed in 2018, since when I've not moved beyond the original drug I was prescribed, Madapar, despite its effectiveness declining. I would like to be dis considered for alternative drugs, deep brain stimulation, and anything else. Am I right in thinking, is that person was diagnosed just only a year before me that actually deep brain stimulation would be quite a bit further on it, it could well be a bit further along i think one of the problems is that the provision of parkinson's services is generally good in the uk but it is quite variable according to the local resources of the trust um and there is no general, particularly helpful prescribing guidelines. So the NICE guidelines for Parkinson's, they have actually just been rewritten. They've been released uh, in the last sort of year. They had loads of PD experts contributed to that. But if you look at it, it's basically, well, you could start levodopa, you could start a levodoping sparing agent, or you could start a doping agonist. And if you're elderly, you know, you could slightly dip, you know, might maybe um, avoid anticholinergic medication. So it's, it's not really that helpful. And the, ba the bottom line is that each, it depends on the individual experience of that consultant who's assessing you, what they've tried before, what they found to be helpful as to what you will actually be prescribed. I think the main thing is that you're under regular review and that you're raising with your specialist nurse who you hopefully have. If you have concerns that your medication is either causing side effects or it's not benefiting you or the benefit is waning because we're missing people who should be referred earlier for more complex surgeries or complex interventions or treatments so deep brain and stimulation how, how uh, what do you mean by regular review how I, right so well national guidelines say that you should be reviewed um at least every six to 12 months by somebody who has expertise in Parkinson's and that you should have access to a Parkinson's specialist nurse as well uh, and you should be given written information at the point of diagnosis uh, from 
uh, charities like Parkinson's UK. You should be provided with written information on uh, new medications that are going to be prescribed. And sadly, uh, we're generally missing the boat in terms of referring people with uh, early complex um, Parkinson's who would benefit from deep brain stimulation. But unfortunately, they've been, they've been referred too late in their process. So by the time they actually come up, due to COVID, they've had a long delay, they see someone, you know, and it's going to take 18 months on the waiting list to get their operation done, you know, something will intervene that will then mean in, either in their general health, their Parkinson's, that they're no longer going to benefit from deep brain stimulation or apomorphine or duodopa. And, you know, this is all about educating people. So what we're doing in Oxford is we're trying to have, um, we're emailing out all the consultants, you know, everyone who sees Parkinson's, and we're saying, look, these are the criteria for referral to Oxford if, if you want to consider someone for surgery, for example. Yeah, now we're gonna go on till eight. Um, I've got loads of questions. I'm gonna try and rattle through some. Um, just, just very quickly, is there stem cell research into Parkinson's? Oh, right, yeah, and someone's also said, yeah, so stem cell research into Parkinson's is absolutely key to our research program at Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre, and there are a number of sites in the UK, Dundee, uh, UCL in London, um, Cardiff that also have stem cell programs, uh, Cambridge as well, and basically you can take skin from, you can take, sorry, you can take cells from a living adult, from a saliva, blood tests, skin biopsy, hair, you isolate from these the cell type, you grow it up, and then you basically force these cells back into a very primitive stem cell. This stem cell has the capacity to then develop and mature into any cell type of the body, brain, right. neuron, eye, heart. So the research that we've done is to take skin biopsies from people with Parkinson's in our cohort, who we know have specific gene mutations causing their Parkinson's, to take them back, those skin cells, into stem cells and then use them as a model in a dish. And we're now doing drug compound screening. So we've got dopamine brain neurons. We've got them in literally hundreds of well plates. And then we're bathing them in different medications to see what makes them live longer. And these drug compound libraries, they're often a thousand medications that pharma companies make available to us. And through this, the Oxford Group have developed two potential drug uh, compounds that we want to do trials on. Right. Uh, is there any research on intermittent fasting? Skipping breakfast, for example. What a mad idea, skipping breakfast. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds totally mad. <laughs> I think the if I've got it right, intermittent fasting is being touted as a good thing to consider because it provokes or it helps to provoke ketonemia which is a slightly higher blood level of ketone however i'm biased because i know from professor kieran clark in oxford that if you try and fast intermittently or go on a ketogenic diet the body is not good enough at producing high enough levels of ketones compared to taking this supplement and it's all about the level of ketone having tried myself as an experiment to do the atkins diet it's miserable uh, there's no fun in life uh, and you don't actually get a high level of keto. So I think that I've probably put that one out the window and it's much Thank more you. important, you know, to have a regular breakfast to keep well hydrated and keep your bowels regular. Now, quite a complicated one here. Some notable patient advocates have called into question the value of research and treatments that aim to reduce excess alpha synuclein, citing lack of proven therapeutic benefit, even when clearance of yeah. has been shown. Should we be taking notice of this? Absolutely. So I still don't know whether or not if you got rid of a subform of alpha synuclein or all alpha synuclein, what would be the benefit to somebody with Parkinson's? Because alpha synuclein is a protein. It's very important. It's there at what we call the synapse, which is the junction from the cell and its long tentacle that it makes. And the, the synapse is how it connects with other cells. So alpha synuclein is a key protein to improve synaptic health. And synaptic health is key for so many things like memory function, movement ability, regeneration of the brain cells themselves. So, you know, what happens if you were to just target 
alpha synuclein. So a lot of the therapies to try and remove alpha synuclein, like antibodies, they're targeted only at subtypes of alpha synuclein. So the point is that in the in the brain, in the living cell uh, and the synapse, alpha synuclein is in its normal form, but it only starts to go wrong when it misfolds and then it starts to clog up and form deposits. And we see those in the cell itself. But I'm still not sure. Maybe it's part of the normal protective response, right, of the cell and the body to just say, this alpha synuclein is dodgy. Let's just sort of package it into a Lewy body and then just put it in the cell and get it out of harm's way. Hmm. Uh, I'm, as a, I said, I'm going to rattle through some of these. Does cinema improve walking balance and mobility? Somebody's sort of questioning whether... Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, if you look at a group level... If somebody is going to get benefit with Parkinson's, uh, then it will improve most aspects. So I've had people with Parkinson's come back and say, since I went on to Cinemet, my sense of smell has improved. And I haven't believed them because they say it's happened within three or four days, but it's happened enough times now for me to believe it's a real thing. In terms of balance and gait, we know it improves from clinical ratings. If just doing a simple timed up and go test at home, where you measure the time it takes, you to get up from a chair walk three meters turn we know yeah. it. i mean it's the main thing i'm on and uh, i notice if i'm wa out walking and i'm yeah. a long time from my last yeah uh pill um any tips on strengthening a weakened voice yeah so it's really frustrating for people when their voice fatigues and often people say that it fatigues at the end of a phone call or a long conversation or if they're just like a grandparent or in company with the family and, the, and they can't get they can't get heard, you know, yeah. <laughs> they can't get a word in. Okay, so, you know, there's no easy fix it. I think optimizing your medication regime is key and timing it so that it's working at its best when you're in your most social, uh, you know, surrounding yeah. is key. I think um, there are proven treatments, the Lee Silverman uh, voice technique or LSVT, it has been shown to improve speech volume and speech intelligibility for people with Parkinson's, but it's a highly demanding course, you know, and it's not delivered on the NHS. It's very expensive and it's, it's very labor intensive. So speech and language therapists, when they see you for communication, you know, firstly, you need to ask for a referral by your, you know, if to a speech and language therapist in some areas, you can refer yourself and you want help for communication and they will offer you and assess you a range of different interventions, including a sort of mini Lee Silverman exercise that you can continue at home, but also things like voice amplification and other modes of communication. What improvements have been introduced to reduce the effect of dyskinesia on people with Parkinson's? Oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, I have to say that a lot of the drugs that were trialled in the last 10 years were trialled on the premise that they would improve dyskinesias, levodopa induced, and they failed to deliver that. So within that, I'm including entacapone, okay, uh, which is a COMT inhibitor, which many people take to reduce wearing off. That's actually been shown to slightly increase dyskinesias. The only medication we have that works is amantadine. Amantadine works for dyskinesias. It doesn't take it away, but it does reduce them significantly. We were involved in Oxford on an anti-dyskinetic trial, an anti-glutamate drug, uh, to see if it helped dyskinesias. Uh, there have been, as far as I'm aware, a number of other studies of alternative drugs that have been generally negative. Often, I think, just having a sensible Parkinson's clinician review what is the trigger for your dyskinesias and then adjust your medication. Smaller amounts, more often, often, as a general rule, work better than high, big peaks, and CR drugs, which are very difficult to control the effect of. Uh, some big, big issues here. Is Parkinson's triggered by environmental toxins like pesticides? Why are we seeing younger and younger people being diagnosed? That's yeah. two different ones. Absolutely. So I recently reviewed a book um, uh, written by Baz Bloom and Ray Dorsey that many of you, you know, may have read, uh, and it goes into environmental toxins and tries to address some of this. Some people think it's a bit over but actually I found the kind of Silicon Valley 
IT sort of, um, you know, pollutants that they found in the soil around California, San Francisco, to be very interesting and quite plausible. Uh, there is a massive impact of environment on who develops Parkinson's, that's your risk, but also on your progression. Uh, the types of proven pesticides are things like um, agricultural uh, exposure to, to pesticides, probably from a very early age. So these are herbicides, pesticides typically used in arable crops, fruit trees, and work there has been mainly pioneered by Beata Ritz in California, where they actually have a per hectare dose exposure to different forms of pesticides. And then they link that to who lived there in the, you know, in the first sort of 60 years of their life. And then it was the people who had the highest risk at a young age, before the age of 20, but who also had a particular normal variant in their genetic makeup, which predisposed them to getting uh, toxicity from this. Other things in the environment, drinking well water, so that's probably the farming thing, uh, mercury, heavy metals, and I suspect quite a lot of IT tech uh, metals and industries. Have that um, answered that question? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was good. Uh, okay. How is atypical Parkinson's diagnosed? What are the treatments? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I happen to do an atypical clinic. I think, firstly, all of these diagnoses, whether it's Parkinson's or atypical, they are clinically diagnosed. They're based on a set of what we call diagnostic criteria. Uh, oh, can I just ask? Uh, I, I, yeah. I, thought, I thought most Parkinson's was atypical in that it was such a variant, various disease. No, right. Okay, so just to, um, just to make the distinction, yeah, Parkinson's disease is not atypical. Well, when I when somebody says atypical Parkinson's, they're talking about a different condition that is um, absolutely confirmed by examining the brain tissue, usually at post mortem. And to put it into perspective, uh, roughly for every twenty people with Parkinson's in the population you live in in the UK, there'll be one with atypical Parkinsonism. And the commonest forms of multiple system atrophy or MSA, progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP, and corticobasal degeneration. These conditions are notoriously difficult to diagnose. The only definitive way is, as I said, to look at the brain at post-mortem uh, or do a brain biopsy, which is not viable. Accuracy for PSP diagnosis compared, clinical diagnosis compared to post-mortem is at best between 50 to 60%. So it's rubbish. Parkinson's, uh, if you follow up someone over a long period of time, you see how they progress, how they respond to medication, is around 85% accurate accuracy. So treatments for atypical, firstly, get the diagnosis right, which is a real challenge, particularly early on. Many people are labelled as having Parkinson's disease, and it's only over time that it becomes clear they haven't got PD, they've got atypical. But treatments are largely... Um, multidisciplinary care which is absolutely key medications of which levodopa will be included there but often because they have more rapid progression they will need more symptomatic benefit for things like muscle stiffness spasticity etc and they need more support with things like earlier like walking eating swallowing i think we're only going to have room for one more question um uh is variation in it and we're going we were going back where we started people have obviously been very interested in the whole exercise thing is variation in exercising better than more monotonous gym programs i, yeah. I can absolutely sympathize with yes. that because yes yes but having done hit programs myself as uh, yeah. in cycling and running just to sort of like you know practice what i preach Varying the routine is key to maintaining your interest, but it also maintains your fitness because you exercise different muscles and you've got different muscle memory. So I think variation is key. And I also I think the encouragement of doing it in a group, whether it's remotely uh, or in, in person in the gym, is really key. And we've got some excellent, you know, local physiotherapists who are neurologically qualified who run these exercise classes. There's also Zoom classes for things like big fold and balance, etc. Well, that has been great. You've been indefatigable, Michelle. I've learned a lot. I'm right. going to go, go away and um, uh, yeah. reflect and we upon get it. The record. We get the record for the um, highest temperature recording for oh, a Parkinson's yeah. NIHR webinar. Yeah, it's still above 30 uh, yeah. in, in West London. Um, yeah. 
although I'm hoping the rain is about to start. Um, thank you, everyone, for providing your questions. I hope you found it insightful and informative. Thanks also to our hosts, the National Institute for Health and Care Research and Cure Parkinson's. Uh, if you want to learn more about research and how you can take part in studies, even if you're healthy, search for the Be Part of Research website. Uh, and you can learn more at Cure Parkinson's at, which is their website, cureparkinson's.org.uk. Uh, you'll be sent a recording of tonight's event as well as an evaluation form. Please do take a moment to complete it. We want to run more of these events, so uh, we want to know what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong. Um, so thank every, thank you all of you, and I hope you have a, a very pleasant and slightly cooler evening. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Maureen, too.